Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Tim Ball. We've done maybe 10 shows on all these different facets related to climatology, climate change, and really getting a handle and understanding of how the whole scenario evolved over time, politically, how science is done in the area of climatology, what are the academic issues related to it, funding, methods of discovery. And recently, in the last year, Dr. Ball has been attacked after writing an article about climate change. He has been sued and is in two lawsuits. He is being attacked so that he stops speaking about his generalist and scientific approach to climate change, which differs from the IPCC definition, translation, and assertion about climate change. He's a very brave man. He's actually standing up and fighting for the right for scientists to speak out to have the right to true discovery. We had a conversation yesterday and the transit of Venus was happening and everybody was talking about it and involved and I was very interested and he started to share some things with me about the history of the transit of Venus. And it was so interesting that I asked him if he would come back on the show and share with us what he knows about it. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Tim Ball back to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Good morning, Kim, and thanks for the opportunity again. My pleasure. Let's talk about the transit of Venus. You always know the most interesting things about history and how things tie together, and you contextualize them very well. Because you're a generalist, when did we start watching the transit of Venus? When did we even know about it? The awareness of of the transit of Venus um, goes back into the 17th century, but um, it really became a, a critical issue in the 18th century because of the burgeoning of science through the Royal Society and, of course, the whole mercantilist approach that is uh, business and expansion and wanting to know about the world and and its resources and its dynamics, but particularly uh, attempting to measure and understand the world. And, of course, that was all of the forerunner to the Industrial Revolution and and the world that we live in today. Why is Venus important to us? Venus has been important in many ways, apart from its love interest. But, um, (laughs) of course, Emmanuel Velikovsky, who wrote uh, the book that shook the world, literally, Worlds in Collision, in which he argued that Venus is not a normal part of our of our uh, solar system it it is the only planet that rotates around its axis in the opposite direction to all the other planets and velikovsky argued that it was captured by the sun um and uh, relatively recently and of course velikovsky got into trouble in the science world cuz he dared to go and look at the hittite and and uh, biblical references and find found no reference to venus in those early documents and uh, but of course velikovsky was seriously attacked by the scientific community for those contrarian views but the um, um in the um middle of the uh, 18th century um uh, at the beginning of it, actually, of course, at the end, at the end of the 17th century, we got Newton producing his laws of gravity, which is basically that the gravity is the uh, force between two objects in space that is a function of the mass of each of them and the distance between them. So, of course, his formula came out uh, and his, his, his theory of gravity published in, in the Principia Mathematica, but... Um, as with all theories, they have to be tested, and and of course one of the difficulties with the um, with Newton's uh, theory was we didn't know the size of our solar system. In other words, the d in his formula for distance simply wasn't known, and so um, the transit of Venus across the face of the sun offered an opportunity to measure the distance of the Earth from the Sun, and that was fundamental to, to determining whether, whether Newton's theory was correct or not. How did they know that at the time? They had Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, the, the Copernicus ideas were now 
uh, pretty firmly entrenched. And don't forget, Newton is at the end of the 17th century, 1680s. Bruno was burned at the stake in 1600, just 80 years before, for daring to say that Copernicus was right. Um, but they they understood, um, and I say Kepler, um, who, by the way, was more interested in astrology than he was astronomy, but Kepler's planetary motions and, and the, the general understanding of, of the solar system and how it operated was already available. And, um, of course, once they started plotting it out, they, they realized that Venus crosses the face of the sun, and it's a, it's a strange cyclical event. Uh, it occurs once, a, a one year, and then it occurs again um, eight years later, uh, and then it doesn't occur again for approximately 120 years. And um, it, 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 it had occurred uh, early in the 18th century, uh, but it, was, uh, it wasn't uh, appropriate to testing uh, Newton's, uh, uh, Newton's theory up with it. But the 1761 transit... Uh, they did. That was when they really started to try and measure the distance uh, or the the size of the sun. And of course, what you measure is you you measure how long it takes the planet Venus to cross the face of the sun. You know the speed of the planet Venus, and of course, with that very simple simple formula, which I always uh, used to teach my students is distance, and the first four letters of that are D-I-S-T. If you convert the I to an equal sign, then e distance equals speed times time. So if you could time how long it took Venus to cross the face of the sun, you knew its speed, so now you have the S and the T in the formula, which then gave you the distance of the Earth from the sun. It was simple trigonometry at that point. But of course, um, in, in terms of, of uh, the, the critical thing was the timing, and of course that was what um, what confronted them in 1761. Uh, the, the results were very, very poor, and basically were were rejected. But then it became um, a political as well as a scientific issue, much as like much like the climatology issue today. How how because did it become that? There was a conflict going on, and of, and of course. Um, uh, Catherine the Great of Russia was involved with with communicating with uh, Voltaire and Diderot and and uh, so on. And uh, Voltaire's uh, uh, wife, by the way, was correcting Newton's mathematics, or not his wife, but his his partner for twenty three years. She was correcting uh, Newton's mathematics, and and um, it it became a contest between the French and the English as to who could um, get the best results on this particular issue. And, and, th and that, uh, by the way, was one of the ways, and, and, and uh, we see this in today's science, is the one way you shake money loose from the powers that be, is to say, hey, you know, um, uh, I can save the planet, or um, this will help us uh, beat the French, or, or some nationalistic, appealing to nationalistic fervor. But, of course, as Samuel Johnson said, and patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. <laughs> but anyway, um, a, 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 they went to George III, who, by the way, was very interested in science. He had a lab set up at Windsor Castle. And he, uh, they said, look, um, uh, the French are going full tilt on this, uh, measuring the transit of Venus or observing the transit of Venus. And so he, he added up 4,000 pounds which was a huge uh, amount of money at that time. Did you say it's like a billion dollars today? The billion dollar reference was that um, one of the things that was happening at that time, because of the um, uh, patronage of people with money, the aristocracy, the royalty, uh, another great um, challenge was to accurately determine longitude. And in 1710, uh, the government of England put up a prize of twenty thousand pounds to anybody who could come up with a method of accurately determining longitude, 
and um, and of course that twenty thousand pounds in today's money is is close to a billion dollars. Okay, there you go. But the four thousand pounds was still a very very significant contribution, and I've even proposed in today's world because most of discovery and most of the innovation occurs in somebody's basement, somebody's backyard workshop. Sure. And 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 um, so if governments offered financial reward, now there are rewards in terms of the marketplace. Uh, in today's world, but that then tends to sort of, um, I think, sully the whole idea of invention and innovation. Well, I want to go back to this. How was it mediated between the French and the English? In other words, how was it resolved? Who discovered what and what was true discovery? Well, of course, what they were doing was uh, they were publishing uh, their results, and there was some cooperation uh, between them. But uh, when it came to things like the transit, um, a lot of the things were done, um, you know, just secretly. I mean, they kept to themselves. They didn't share information. But but the, the real driving force uh, was amongst the science scientists. Who, who, like with today's climate issue, just, um, you know, don't want the politics involved in it. Politics and science is a deadly mix. And, and um, so, of course, the scientists of the time wanted to pursue the science, but unfortunately, the only way they could do it was by uh, taking the money. And, um, I, you know, I mean, I, it used to bother me when I used to go in and get research grants, and I, then I uh, genuinely rationalized it, and it's a bit uh, egotistical, but I said, you know, Leonardo da Vinci had to get funding. Who the hell am I to, to you know, um, worry about where the money's coming from? The key thing is that you don't sell your soul to produce the results that the money wants you to produce. Right. And, and of course, this was part of the difficulty with the transit of Venus. Um, I mean, Why? the scientists, the astronomers, one that we can talk about, uh, William Wales, uh, who was one of the top mathematicians in astronomy of the day, um, he finally agreed to go to the best place in the world to observe the transit, which was Churchill, Manitoba. But he didn't want to go, and he was only persuaded by a friendship with um, the um, uh, secretary of the Royal Society, Samuel Wegg. Uh, the Royal Society had tried to get uh, a whole bunch of astronomers to go. They all begged off because uh, one thing that I don't think they wanted to go to Churchill, particularly on Hudson Bay, because you, you, it was a 13-month trip for a seven-hour period of observation of the transit. And, of course, you could have cloud cover and, and, and be totally wasted time. But also they all knew that with the instruments they had, uh, it, it just simply wasn't doable. But but Wales uh, saw the opportunity to not only um, observe the transit, but also to gather a whole a bunch of other information. And, and in fact, um, he provided, uh, he did a great deal of work while he was at Churchill, including bringing uh, thermometers and barometers with him to produce some of the earliest temperature and bar- barometric pressure readings in, in North America. Why is Venus important to us? Is it also astrology, do you think? Do you think that there's Masonic interest in Venus? Why we're paying attention to the transit of Venus? What do you oh, think? I, there, there's no question. I mean, I, I mentioned the um, astrology earlier, particularly, um, you know, with, with uh, Kepler. Right. I mean, Kepler, when you read all his work, it's just babblings about astrology. And, uh, and of course, astronomers go to great lengths to separate themselves from, from astrology. But when you read Kepler's works, and I haven't read all of them, but I've read enough of them, because um, somebody said his three laws of planetary motion are simply um, passing aside in a whole verbiage of stuff. And it was only later that somebody went back and picked them out and strung them together and said, look, here's Kepler's laws of planetary motion. But if you think about Venus, it's brightness in, in, the, in the sky, right. it's association with love, and of course that goes back to Roman and Greek times. 
so yeah, Venus Venus is very important to us emotionally, astrologically, and of course then with the transit of Venus also scientifically. I have a question directly for you about your own impression. Do you think at this point in your life that there is, and I mean this astrologically, an astrological influence that communicates itself magnetically with different planets and the way they influence us here and they influence what's going on the earth. Even though you're a scientist and you're not supposed to talk about it, do you think that there is a place for astrology in terms of magnetic expression? Absolutely. And one of the things that I've tried to do as a scientist is not to uh, poo-poo or disregard anything. I mean, one of, one of the things that I've worked with is oral tradition of Native peoples and uh, worked with the observations of the farmers and, and people that live, empirical observations. I mean, for example, I do not disregard the um, folklore on weather. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Pus Puxitani Phil, the, uh, uh, and, and the, those weather prognostications, those originated from, from uh, Russia, but there they used the badger. It was just when the ideas came to North America, they didn't have a badger, so they substituted. But it, it, um, and it, it's, uh, predictions of six weeks of cycles of weather, you know, for winter and summer, um, relate to sunspot uh, activity and, and jet, jet stream cycles. So I never disregard anything. But with regard to your question about magnetism, I have said uh, for 40 years now that two issues of the 21st century that are, are going to be focal. Water. Water. Right. And the other is magnetism. Yeah. And the role of magnetism in... Um, affecting everything on the planet. Right. We've known, for example, for a long time that if you plot the strength of the Earth's magnetic field at noon and then um, the temperature, uh, there's a four-day lag. But as the, what it's called the Gaussian strength of the magnetic field, as it varies, then four days later the temperature varies. If you do it on a longer scale, it's a four-year lag between changes in the Earth's magnetic field and the temperature. And there is a very good scientist who I think you've interviewed by the name of Piers Corbin, yes. who has been producing um, very, very accurate weather forecasts uh, on the basis of the uh, magnetic field. No, see, I didn't even know that. No, well, of, of course, it, it... He doesn't really say what his... No, no. Well, because, because you see, uh, it's, it's a trade secret. <laughs> I mean, if, well, so it's, if, it's, if he it's, gives it's... out his secret, then, then the weather offices could use it and do better forecasts and periods couldn't oh, make any money out Oh, my it. God, so, so what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> You're well, outing uh, the trade secret of the weather wizard in London. <laughs> no, 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 because because I don't know if you know this, but Piers and I went to the same convent-run elementary school in England. <laughs> That's one of those wild. bizarre events in, in history, a coincidence. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, uh, Piers makes no uh, bones about the fact that magnetism is involved in, oh, in I'm, his forecasting. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, and he's also, by the way, now expanding it. And this is this is as controversial as his forecasting. He's now making forecasts for earthquakes based on the magnetic changes. Interesting. Yes, and there was a Dr. Brown. It was a wonderful uh, documentary made several years ago. Dr. Brown was was using magnetism to influence the growth of plants. Oh yeah, magnetite probably. Well, magnetite is the most sensitive of the minerals in the Earth's crust. I hear that plants grow incredibly well with it. Oh, my God. Yeah, but you, not only that, but he showed that you can, you can change the direction of the growth of the plant by simply changing the magnetic strength of the field around it. And the other thing is that there is, is very, very good research uh, because all animals have trace levels of magnetite in their brains. Yes. And pigeons... When they're released into certain areas of the Earth, there's a, there's a sort of a, a magnetic hole off the coast of New Jersey where if you release the pigeons, they simply are lost. They fly around in circles, even though the sun might be shining. And and uh, the use of, of, of the magnetic field of the Earth in terms of navigation skills, I think, is very critical. 
But here's the interesting part of it, uh, uh, Kim, is that I think that when people are born, the magnetic field in the area w in which they're born is imprinted. I mean, you think about uh, Lorenz and his studies on imprinting on, on uh, babies when they're born, uh, the, uh, the idea of um, the child and the mother, the imprinting that goes on. I think that, that the uh, brain is imprinted with the magnetic field in where they're born, which is why um, you never really feel comfortable until you go back to the area in which you were born. Very interesting. I want to go back to the transit of Venus have you explained what you shared with me yesterday on the phone when we were talking about the secret orders that the Queen gave to Sir Francis yeah. Drake? Well, Talk well, course, about that. Yeah, of, of course, the Masonic orders and, and, and the, the, the symbol, you know, that drafting um, thing that they have in, in, in their logo shows that um, numbers and science is at the very center of the, the Masonic Lodge and orders and so on. And, um, and of course, so many people throughout history have been involved in that. But Drake uh, was sent, uh, well, two things that he was directed to do, uh, basically. One was to circumnavigate the world, because, of course, they wanted to show that the English could do that. And they went, again, it was starting to get ideas about the size of the Earth and so on. But also, he was directed to find the Northwest Passage from the western side of North America. All we read about in, in the textbooks and history books is, is all the searches for the eastern end with Frobisher and, and Henry Hudson and everybody else. But Drake was under secret orders from Elizabeth, and uh, these are in the, in the records, to find it from the western end. But he was also charged with determining a longitude now, this preceded, of course, uh, the prize that was put up in 1710. The English, um, once you get into, uh, into trade and navigation, uh, distance becomes a factor. So, for example, if, if you look at uh, early maps, they tell you what's important to people about the dimensions of the Earth. Um, the uh, Phoenician maps are accurate for direction because the Phoenicians were trading in the Mediterranean and out along the western coast of Europe. But they didn't care about distance because they, that was controlled by the wind and the currents. And you set out and you were going to get there when you were going to get there. But it was important that you know which direction to go to get there. So their maps reflected that. The Roman Empire, of course, is a different situation. The Roman maps are very accurate for distance and direction, because if you're going to, uh, first of all, you, you have oars, and you can row your vessels so that you can overcome the wind and the tide to, to some extent. But also, if you're marching armies, you want to know the distance. And, of course, if you look at Roman roads throughout Europe, one of the things that um, is symptomatic of them is that they are in straight lines wherever possible. How did you find out and verify that Sir Francis Drake had secret orders from the Queen? Now, you said it's in the records, but what records? How did you personally find that out? I've worked with a lot of people that have written books about uh, various aspects of history. And there was a, a, a minister of the crown here in British Columbia by the name of Sam Balf, B-A-W-L-F. And Sam had got interested in, what well, he was interested in sailing and discovery on the West Coast here in, in Canada. And when he retired, uh, he, he set about discovering uh, what Drake had done. And, uh, and of course, he needed somebody that could reconstruct the weather conditions that Drake experienced on the West Coast here in 1579, which was the year in which he uh, arrived. So Sam, of course, had got into uh, in the um, uh, archives and the documents at the um, uh, Maritime Museum in England, and um, and in fact, the instructions that Drake had got from Elizabeth and then the reports that Drake submitted to the Admiralty, which Elizabeth grabbed when he got back and, and you know, 
put them away. Uh, they were used later to as uh, sailing instructions for uh, Captain Vancouver and Captain Cook and, and Bly sailing into the Pacific Ocean. So um, this is this is how I got involved in it. But I had al- already been very very interested in it by the reconstruction of weather conditions, but also um, in in terms of uh, my absolute fascination with uh, Elizabeth I, who I think is without question the greatest leader in history. Why do you say uh, that? Well, because she took over a country that had been completely uh, destroyed in every sense of the term by her father. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, he had um, uh, well, the, the religious issue that uh, that he created, and of course Elizabeth and, and and people read history and think, well, Henry they said Henry said we're all Protestant, and overnight that happened. There are still Catholic holdouts. In fact, in England now, there are more Anglicans going back to be Catholics because of what's going on with the Anglican faith, and and um, so the the religious issue. He he absolutely bankrupted with his crazy ideas about uh, ships and power and so on, and his expenditures on on castles and building. But by destroying to pay for this, he destroyed the monasteries and took over their land. But in destroying the monastery, monasteries, he destroyed the whole social fabric of England because education and health and concern about the poor was done by the church. And so when Elizabeth took over, she had to, she introduced the, um, uh, an education system, the grammar school system in England, which uh, served it so well for centuries. She uh, organized that. She organized the poor laws, which, which are, are still operating in England and are the basis of, of the whole um, health and, and, and welfare system in England. And um, she also um, never, ever built a palace. She said, I won't waste the people's money. Uh, she never went to war unless it was forced on her. And, of course, the Spanish Armada was part of that. So, um, you know, to take a country that was in such terrible, terrible condition and to turn it around as she did, I mean, she really uh, uh, created the uh, England as, as the great nation that it became. And, of course, she did that also in terms of the social structure because she promoted plays and music and um, uh, you think about Shakespeare and John Donne and uh, Sir Philip Sidney and all of the things. She played music herself. She wrote music herself. Um, she, she was an incredible person. She spoke uh, seven languages, including Welsh. And I like to joke that even the Welsh can't speak Welsh. <laughs> but Elizabeth did it. No, I mean, there, there, there is, it, 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 she is without equal. I got it. Okay. And, uh, no, that's great. It's great. Yeah. The question about the orders to Drake. Yes. On the science side, Elizabeth's geopolitical ambitions were driven by a Dr. John Dee, and he's referred to in history as the Queen's Conjurer. So he was sort of a magician. He, by the way, was also her astrological advisor, because Elizabeth did things by astrological signs. She, her, the date of her coronation was done on the... Uh, on the um, basis of the astrological signs that Dee gave her. So that um, uh, was part of, of, of her whole uh, operation process. But Dee had worked out a method of determining longitude using observations of the phases of the moon. It was a very complex system, and Drake was ordered to uh, try it out and there is a place on, on the coast of Oregon where there are cairns and uh, the sight lines, which was Drake's experiment to determine the longitude of the west coast of North America. And Drake then went back to England. Elizabeth met him on his ship, ordered him to silence, said, you, you are not to tell anybody what you have found and what you've done. You can tell the world you circumnavigated around the world because obviously you're back here. 
But she then turned over all of his charts and documents to her spy master, uh, Francis Walsingham, who then changed the latitudes in his documents and his logs because he didn't want the Spanish to know how far north he had gone and the fact that he believed he'd found the, the western end of the Northwest Passage. Elizabeth believed that if she could control the eastern end of the Northwest Passage and the western end of it, she could then control the North Atlantic and the North Pacific and therefore control the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. And John Dee produced a most incredible map, which I show to audiences when I talk about this, and it takes them a long time to figure out what they're looking at. It's a map of the world looking down on the North Pole. And, of course, most people never see a map like that. All they see is a map of the world with the Arctic Ocean stretched across the top with the North Pole, which is actually a single point, as a line longer than or as the equal to the length of the equator, which is actually physical nonsense. How was it validated that the map that Drake brought back was changed. Drake uh, wanted, uh, as with most of these people, that um, you know they they want the recognition for their discoveries. And but he was very loyal to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, of course, put about that he was a, a pirate, uh, which simply wasn't true at all. He was very well educated. He spoke several languages as well, and um, and of course, um, uh, was, this is a typical move of Elizabeth. Uh, she said, uh, "Oh, but, and, and this is all reported, by the way, by the French ambassador who Elizabeth invited to come on board with her, and so that he could report report back to Philip of Spain what was going on, because she knew he was a, uh, what he was doing." And she said to um, to Drake, "Look, uh, Philip wants his gold back, and I'm going to give it to him." And then, on an aside to Drake, she said, "But of course, I don't know how much you've got." So what she was saying to him was, look, help yourself, and then we'll send him back whatever's left over, <laughs> but, which, was, which was typical of Elizabeth. It was so uh, much an awareness of human nature as it really is, which was her great strength. And, and so um, now uh, Drake, of course, wants, wants to do more than tell the world that he sail, uh, sailed around the world. And, and so um, he toddles off to... Uh, to uh, uh, visit Ortelius, who was the great map maker of that day, and um, uh, what you, the way that the world maps were expanded was everybody that made discoveries went to the biggest map maker, and the map maker added on then that portion that this person had discovered, and so within three months of Drake landing in in London, he's in uh, talking to Ortelius, and Ortelius brings out a map in which the west coast of North America is shifted 60 degrees of longitude west to its close to its actual position. Would you like to meet the queen? Yes. I, of course, my problem is I don't believe in reincarnation. <laughs> but that, as the guy said, I didn't believe in it last time I was here either. <laughs> no, if, 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 I, if I could choose one person in history, she's the one person I would want to meet. Now, you like her very much. Now, why did she call Drake a pirate? Well, because she wanted the French and particularly the Spanish to think she had no control over him. That what he was doing, raiding their ships, was, uh, was done on his own hook. That he, w that he was essentially a, a, an uncontrolled pirate. When Queen Elizabeth said that he was a pirate, did he yeah. suffer as a result of that? Or did he know that this was the hand she was going to play? He knew the hand she was going to play. This was a very long worked out scheme of his entire voyage. So, no, he was involved with it right from the beginning. For example, the ship that he bought that they changed, the Golden Hind, he uh, had the hull reinforced in order to uh, handle the ice that he thought he would confront on the west coast of North America. Now, of course, they assumed that because Frobisher was getting into heavy ice in Hudson Straits, that they would get the same situation on the West Coast, being at the same latitude. And, of course, they, they, never, they didn't realize about different currents and different uh, water temperatures and so on. And, and also, um, while the uh, hind was being reinforced, he waited until Frobisher came back uh, on his second voyage to report on what he had discovered, and then, and then Drake left. 
and um, so uh, the the other. The, there was all, there were so many other parts of this story because uh, Frobisher got involved in a, a um, the, I think the first great stock swindle in North American history because uh, he uh, landed on an island that is now called Codlernan Island, which is in Uktitut for White Man's Island, and um, he he picked up some gold. And he took it back, and a German chemist told uh, told them it was gold. And Elizabeth invested a lot of money in Frobisher's expedition, and um, Drake as well. And uh, in fact, Frobisher ended up uh, on four different voyages. The last one, he took um, uh, forty miners from Cornwall from the tin mines, and you can you can see it. I've seen it from the air. I haven't seen it from the ground. They built it a jetty to land their small boats, and you can see it, the hole in the cliff where they mined to get this gold. Well, of course, it turned out it was fool's gold, iron pyrites, and the, the German chemist uh, made a, a, a lot of money off of it. And of course, Elizabeth had invested a thousand pounds of her own money, and um, uh, Frobisher only saved, saved his neck by saying, "Look, um, I know, I know the uh, where the Northwest Passage is, and if you kill me, that'll go to the grave with me." <laughs> and so he used that power to stay alive. <laughs> that was smart. Yeah. What I loved was that there was a great trial about it. The evidence was this: forty tons of iron pyrites that he had shipped back with him. And in the trial, one of the final things is that the evidence simply became part of the Queen's Highway. <laughs> so they, they just threw the rock out to, to, to make it a more solid highway somewhere in England. But it was a huge stock swindle. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us about the transit of Venus? Well, I think that the important thing is that when William Wales, who was the astronomer, that uh, finally agreed to uh, go and make the measurements. And um, he was uh, in charge of the whole project of the transit was Sir Neville Maskelyne, who was the Astronomer Royal. And you have an Astronomer Royal today. It's, a, it's sort of like the Poet Laureate. These are very important positions. And Maskelyne was um, not only in charge of organizing the observations of the transit of Venus, but he was also in charge of organizing determination of longitude. And three weeks before, he instructed William Wales and his assistant, Joseph Diamond, uh, to go to Churchill and what they, were, what they were required to do by the Royal Society. He had given instructions to uh, Mason and Dixon, uh, and of course that became important in, in American history of, of establishing the Mason-Dixon line. And so um, Masculine and, and all of these things were all linked together in this attempt to measure the size of, of the Earth and, the, and our solar system and so on. Now Masculine, of course, um, uh, actually was in charge of the committee that was determining what was the best way of measuring longitude. Uh, Masculine let his own biases um, persuade that because he wanted it to be an astronomical way, in fact, the same as John Dee had proposed, but the actual uh, solution was in the chronometer that an ordinary clockmaker from Yorkshire by the name of William Harrison uh, produced. And Harrison's chronometers are one of the most incredible pieces of technology ever produced. And the precision and the inventions that he created himself to produce that chronometer, those chronometers. There were, were, there were four uh, samples of them. They're now on display in the Maritime Museum in Greenwich. And, of course, Greenwich is the, uh, the international uh, dateline. And um, uh, Maskelyne um, blocked Harrison uh, ever getting the 20,000-pound prize. Uh, but um, Maskelyne also... Um, uh, Wales, when he got back, refused to turn over the uh, results of the observation that he'd made. Um, he, as I said, he knew that they were um, 
grossly inadequate. As a scientist, he was embarrassed by them. But he already knew before he left that it was difficult to do. That's why so many of the other astronomers had turned it down. But his biggest problem was what we talked about earlier. You had to have a very precise measurement of the time that it takes Venus to cross the face of the sun. So, so an accurate watch was critical. Now, you think about he didn't have access to uh, Harrison's chronometer. He did have a watch, but the problem was the watch wasn't uh, designed to cope with the very cold temperatures that they experienced. I mean, a watch functions uh, very differently. Any machinery functions very differently, differently at minus 30 and minus 40. But they already knew, because they were testing it while they were crossing the Atlantic, that the watch was losing anywhere from 12 to 18 minutes a day, which meant that the, that the watch simply wasn't adequate for what they wanted to do. Now, Wales, um, uh, as I said, he refused to turn in his results, and, but he, he, they finally said, you must turn them in, and he did. But what Wales did was, I think, that he tried to solve the problem of time because in the 1970s, when they were doing some archaeological digs around the old stone fort at Churchill, Wales and Diamond had set up a prefabricated observatory that they built at the fort. Um, and um, on, outside the walls of the fort, these archaeologists dug up a sundial. And the sundial is unique. Uh, well, not completely unique. There's another one similar to it ironically, in a convent in France. Um, but it, it, it has 25, or sorry, 24 different sundial faces. If your watch isn't working and you're trying to get some better timing device, Wales knew enough about sundials and their construction to be able to build a sundial that could give him the time within two minutes, which was superior to what the watch he had could give him. And Wales was the only person that had been in Churchill that could do that. Now, I had written in an article about the latitude that, that uh, Wales had determined for the fort at Prince of Wales. A, a person at the National Museum of Canada was researching the sundial and had calculated the latitude for which the sundial was built, because a sundial only functions at the latitude for which it is designed. And he said, where did you get that latitude from? And I said, well, it was Wales in his journals. And he said, well, that's the latitude for the sundial. And so we concluded that from this that this was circumstantial evidence that Wales had built that sundial in an attempt to have a, a timing device that would at least give him a chance of getting a better measurement of the transit of Venus. And um, uh, But, of course, being Wales and being the um, uh, man that he was, he didn't just do the flat surface. He, he did it at 24 different surfaces. That sundial is now in the museum at Churchill, and it's one of the most unique in the world. And it's one of the challenges I always make to scientists today. There are very few people in today's world that could build a sundial. I bet that's true. Yep. And it's like, it's like I always say about Stonehenge. I mean, they didn't know until they started doing computer analysis that the Aubrey holes, the stones around the outside of Stonehenge, which are the smallest stones, are markers of a 19-year lunar eclipse that modern science didn't know about. Fascinating. Yep. Well, I want to thank you for coming to the show and sharing all this neat history that most of us would never know and is separated in little bits out there, like little digits. <laughs> Well, it, it is it is uh, putting the puzzle together, and when you finally put the puzzle together and step back, you say, my, that's quite an interesting picture. Very interesting, and you have a very interesting way of sharing history. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to Dr. Tim Ball, and you can reach him by going to drtimball.com, and you can read his hundreds and soon-to-be thousands of articles. Stay tuned for his new book, which should be coming out by the end of this year. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Kim.